if you do that, you can then show that that metric becomes effectively b tau squared times some number plus d rho squared times rho squared. So after doing a variable change, which is very easy to identify, you can recast that metric in this form. Okay. Uh, the key point is that tau is like an angular variable because it's the Euclidean time direction. So tau is periodic with period beta. And if you look at this, this is basically the metric of flat two-dimensional space-time written in polar coordinates. But it would be the metric of flat two-dimensional space-time in polar coordinates without any singularities at all. Origin, only if this number and the periodicity of this angular direction are such that when you redefine, when you redefine, redefine, absorb this number into a redefined angular variable, that new angular variable has period precisely two pi. Okay. So, uh, in order to avoid conical singularity at the origin. If you want to avoid a conical singularity at the origin, you basically end up with a condition that relates the periodicity of the time direction, which is the temperature, to the horizon size. And this formula actually is true in any dimension. You can do this for black holes in any dimension, this exercise, and the relationship between uh, this function, once you know this f of r function, uh, the derivative of the f of r function at the horizon gives you the temperature of the uh, of the black hole. Okay. Um, can I take just two minutes and I'll just finish yeah. finish something and then we can continue. Here. Because there is a kind of punchline here. So. For our ADS3 black hole metric, if you do this exercise, f is just a quadratic function. It was r squared minus rh squared. And if you take the derivative, first derivative of that at rh, you will find that the relation is that the horizon size is related to the temperature by this simple formula. Okay. Now comes the key point. Once you know the horizon size of a black hole, you can calculate its entropy. Well, once you have the entropy of the black hole, uh, by ADS3 CFT2, you have the entropy of the boundary CFT, you have its density of state. Okay? So, this gives me the horizon size. The entropy, by the Bekenstein formula, is basically the area of the horizon, which is 2 pi, so the, we are talking about black holes in three dimensions, so the horizon is uh, so the, the, the horizon is uh, uh, the horizon is spatial one-dimensional circle. So when we talk about the area of the horizon, it's two pi times uh, two pi times the radius of the horizon, which is two pi times two pi t. And then we have to divide this by four times Newton's constant in three dimensions. So entropy is area divided by four g. That's Bekenstein's form. Right. So, what does this uh, give us? So, this gives us pi square times t divided by Newton's constant. And then if we use Brown and Heno's relation that g is equal to 3L over, sorry, the, the central charge of the CFT is related to Newton's constant, then this is just 2 pi square uh, t times the central charge uh, divided by 3. So this makes use of brown henos relation. And we can do something more. Uh, because we know that black holes have thermodynamics, we've calculated their entropy, so we can calculate the free energy too. Because the entropy is given by the first derivative of the free energy, with respect to temperature, uh, we then deduce from this that the free energy of this black hole is minus pi square p squared divided by 2g, 
you can that's just obtained by integrating the expression for the entropy. And energy or mass of the black hole is actually free energy plus T times entropy. So you do this algebra and you find that the energy is pi squared T squared divided by 2G, which is pi squared T squared C divided by 3. Okay? Now you can do the algebra, you can find the relationship between the energy and the entropy. Okay. Uh, we see that the entropy goes like the temperature, the energy goes like the temperature squared, and there's factors of uh, the central charge. So if you again do the algebra, you will find that the entropy goes like pi times square root 4 E C divided by 3. Okay? So that means that the density of states for the black hole, the density of states <coughs> associated to the black hole saddle point black hole saddle point uh, scales like exponential of that which is e to the pi square root of uh, 4e c over 3 and if you go back and compare this with Cardi's formula, you will see that this is actually bang on, except I think I might have screwed up some factors of 2 here and there. So I think the way I wrote, so one has to go and check the factors of 2. But you will see that the dependence on the energy and the central charge is exactly the same. Okay. So uh, what I haven't told you, ah, uh, how much leeway will you give me? One more minute? Or <laughs> let, let, let me finish this. Let, let me finish this because uh, it's kind of don't want to be a time. Right? So, um, the density of states associated to this ADS3 black hole saddle point grows like that. The, the free energy of the black hole saddle point scales like temperature squared. And there was another saddle point which was just ordinary thermal ADS. Now, that ordinary thermal ADS. Uh, you can calculate its free energy, you can calculate its mass, but there's nothing interesting in it. Um, all the non-trivial classical, all the non-trivial dependence on temperature in the black hole uh, solution came about because of this funny property of the geometry, that in the Euclidean black hole, the temporal circle has to pinch off to zero size, and then we had to require smoothness condition, and that smoothness related the entropy of the black hole to the temperature, and from that we deduced the thermodynamics. For the thermal ADS solution that we wrote down before, nothing interesting happens to this temperature circle. It remains, it remains non-shrinking everywhere in the geometry. Geometry is locally just antidecitor, there's nothing interesting in it. Not surprisingly, if you sit and calculate using standard, uh, you know, using careful uh, holographic regularization and whatnot, you calculate the free energy and the mass of that, uh, that geometry, you will find that it has nothing interesting. So in particular, to summarize, there are two saddle points which have two different behaviors for free energy. And what we should be doing is, since we are talking about finite temperature, this is a canonical ensemble, we should be, uh, and we are localized on the saddle point, we should be comparing these two saddle points. Okay, so if you, uh, so the complication between thermal ADS 3 and ADS 3 black hole is the following uh, and it's encapsulated in this graph which is basically free energy versus temperature. So like I said the thermal ADS 3 its free energy is just given by this dotted line. It has no non-trivial dependence on temperature. In fact, you can calculate the free energy and it's given by minus C over 12. Uh, in fact, so that, that's related to the fact that the mass, if you calculate the mass of the thermal ADS3 solution uh, correctly, you will find that it's negative. And it corresponds to the fact that the ground states uh, that, that this is actually the ground state of the CFT. So if you, if you know what 2D CFTs are, this 
minus C over 12 just corresponds to the shift of the ground state energy by minus C over 24, the Casimir energy uh, on, the, on the surface. So this is, this is just the uh, thermal ADS3, its free energy remains constant as a function of temperature. Nothing interesting happens. But if you look at uh, the black hole solution, its free energy goes like minus T squared. So clearly, that's the behavior and there is a crossover point in between the two. Right? So there is a there's a temperature at which I didn't write down what the temperature was, but that temperature yeah, is an order one temperature. So this is some temperature of order one, something like two over pi or one over two pi, something like that. That's exactly the temperature at which the uh, Hawking page this this transition between so there is a transition. between thermal ADS3 and uh, ADS3 black hole. So for all temperatures below this critical temperature which uh, is called the Hawking page temperature, P Hawking page, for all temperatures below this Hawking page temperature, the Thermal ADS3, which is basically the vacuum solution, dominates the ensemble. Once the temperature crosses the Hawking page line, uh, sorry, the Hawking page value, the black hole solution dominates. So that means there's something, the CFTs, which have a CFT which has classical gravity in ADS3 as its dual description, is a weird kind of CFT. Because thermal ADS3, there's nothing, it's, it's a vacuum state. So the density of states is actually uh, zero to begin with. And then you hit, after a particular gap, the density of states suddenly grows exponentially. So put another way, the, at temperatures below the Hawking page transition, uh, below the Hawking page temperature, the density of states is zero or one. There's only one ground state. Okay, there's a gap in the system and then Immediately after T, the temperature, for any temperature bigger than the Hawking page temperature, because the solution is dominated by, because the ensemble is dominated by the black hole, the density of states grows exponentially with energy in the way Cardi formula predicts. So, what is weird about these systems is that Cardi growth kicks in. The Cardi growth kicks in. at a temperature of order 1, okay, whereas in an ordinary, C any ordinary CFT you expect that the Cardi exponential growth behavior will only kick in at temperatures much bigger than 1, okay. Here what you are saying is that there is actually an abrupt value of the temperature immediately above which, at which is of order 1, immediately above which the density of states grows exponentially. Below that temperature, there's nothing. There's only one ground state. So you can see it's a, these CFTs that must have classical gravities. Classical ADS3 gravities as they do have to be weird. They have to have a ground. They have to have a ground state, a gap, and then suddenly a huge uh, density of states. And that's not generic, by no means. A generic 2D CFT doesn't have that behavior. So in particular, there are of course many examples in string theory. Where there are conformal field theories in engineer and appropriate deep brain systems which are dual to string theories compactified on ADS3 cross S3 cross something. And in those cases, one can argue that the properties of those CFTs are sufficiently exotic that they must exhibit this kind of behavior. But this, this behavior is by no means generic. Okay, thank you. I stop. Yeah, so we are putting the CFT on a circle, so now yeah. that's... Yeah, to get some non-trivial thermodynamics, you have to introduce...